Well, traders, it's Saturday, March the 18th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your market wrap-up for this past trading week, as well as an out for what we can expect in the trading week ahead of us. Well, if we had to compare between what we had last week and what we had next week, it would be quite clear that the docket, the measure of event risk that was behind us and what lies ahead is dramatically different, almost night and day. This past week we were met with a range of high profile event risk including updates on Brexit as well as important Chinese data, uh, meetings between the US uh, leadership as well as a number of others, uh, G20 heading into the weekend, as well as very clearly the central bank rate decisions topped by the Fed. All very important, all have great influence or sway over market expectations and theoretically positioning the week ahead however has a much more reserved docket uh, we do have noteworthy event risks that's certainly true and we can always tap uh, uh, themes that uh, all they need is catalyst but nothing on the docket that would single-handedly threaten the safety and stability of the financial market. It's not like a FOMC rate decision. All right. Now, that being said, I don't want to urge people into uh, the complacency that seems so infectious in the markets. I would actually urge even greater vigilance. Consider, if you would, uh, what you would think if you saw a market tumble aggressively following a major event. Let's say the FOMC rate decision had promoted a full-scale risk aversion. Uh, there would be some measure of comfort, even though uh, people would be certainly very at uh, uh, unease uh, because of the drop in the markets, but they would be comforted to some extent because they know what would have motivated it. Then they can look into the, the details and see what would trigger it. They can make wise uh, market decisions and move more quickly uh, to exit. That could lead to a faster and kind of a flash in the pan kind of drop, but it is something that encourages people's attention and it focuses them to actually act. Alternatively, what happens if in a week like we have in the upcoming week, we actually see a systemic pullback? What if risk trends, uh, the markets uh, over, had started to drop just out of risk consistently across all these markets? And there was nothing that we could really attach it to. That's going to lead to a, a situation of considerable chaos. Why? Well, a lot of people will hold off from deleveraging because they don't see a particular catalyst that uh, would uh, promote their concern and they wouldn't understand why other traders are perhaps uh, fleeing. Staying with the market in those circumstances would be very dangerous because a systemic shift in, in exposure and sentiment uh, can happen regardless of what the catalyst is. I go into detail about the exposure and uh, kind of the mechanical issues uh, for the markets uh, that's behind the complacency in the strategy video for the week, and you can check that out there. But it's not the catalyst that matters so much. It's what happens as the market starts to deliver. And without a clear catalyst, uh, a particular event, uh, a lot of people will hold off. They will believe that this is just a modest correction or a speculative uh, jolt that is going to return back to the very comfortable uh, settings of complacency. And that could lead to a lot of problems. It can be very distortional and then we can uh, find those very big pockets uh, where liquidity just simply vanishes and then people are all of a sudden looking to get out and wholesale not knowing what is motivating their actions, and that is even scarier than knowing that there's a drop because of a particular event helped triggered, uh, triggered that move. So don't be too complacent uh, given the circumstances of the docket being otherwise thinner than what we have seen in the past two weeks. All right. Now, Looking at some of the bigger uh, moves that we had from the market, it is worth taking it currency by currency. The currency that is most prominent, I think, uh, heading into the new week, uh, given the circumstances for this last week's uh, uh, very remarkable uh, docket item, uh, is the dollar. 
The dollar is in a uh, significant down uh, spill. It's not uh, a full-scale uh, momentum drop, but it certainly is positioning in such a way that it's quite clearly being projected as dovish. Now that's remarkable given the circumstances because the motivation for this move seemed to be uh, the FOMC rate decision. That FOMC rate decision absolutely led to a rate hike, something that was heavily expected, however. So we have, on one hand, a very clear divergence to its global counterparts. The U.S. dollar and the Federal Reserve is in a unique position, especially relative to the other most liquid currencies in the world, the euro, yen, and pound, where they are being held under by a very dovish policy. Although there are some early, early signs of uh, that, that turnaround that is inevitable in policy towards normalization. So despite this, the dollar is still pulling back, and that was heavily because of the speculation uh, that was built into the rate decision. Now looking forward, the probability of a rate hike at the next meeting has not uh, picked up at significantly at all after this past week's uh, hike. Uh, we are now in a range between 0.75 and 1%. Hasn't been this high in seven, eight years. Uh, What's more, the Fed, as we talked about uh, after the FOMC rate decision and during the FOMC rate decision, is still only pricing in two more rate hikes this year, so three total. And in those terms, we can see that the markets are still somewhat uh, buoyant in their speculation. I'm, I've changed this, so this is the December 13th uh, rate decision, everything priced into there. Uh, so this is 2017. The market is still pricing in uh, two more rate hikes, which is the dark, uh, the medium shade gray and green here. Uh, that's still the primary expectation. There is a hardy forecast of only one more rate hike, uh, but three rate hikes is the dark green, still drawing approximately 18% probability, and the chance of four more rate hikes is still a hefty, and I have to say hefty because considering the improbability of it, it's still being projected as a approximately 4% probability. There's still some, some considerable speculation here beyond what the Fed is forecasting. So if the dollar's already reached aggressively because of this, then as data uh, or sentiment from Fed officials starts to ease back, the dollar has room to actually pull back. It's not protected from by the fact that, yes, it is the most hawkish central bank. That doesn't matter. It's about how we move in this curve and how it's moving relative to its counterparts so others can catch up. On that front, we have quite a, a bit of uh, rate speculation that's going to go on because not really in the data, but in the Fed speak. We have quite a bit of Fed speak uh, through the coming week. All right, Yellen on Thursday, highest profile. Uh, actually, keep a closer eye on Kashkari and Kaplan, uh, M. Bollard and Evans. Uh, through the end of the week, these have t become two of the more hawkish of the central bankers. Noteworthy through the end of this past week, Kashkari, who has been very hands off and uh, uh, dovish, but more so hands off. Uh, he actually gave a uh, a. a a write-up on why he dissented in his vote to not to hike. And his concern was actually on the uh, balance of policy approach and coming up with a plan for the balance sheet. Uh, this is actually a greater debate that has come about because of the ECB talking about the possibility of hikes before they actually uh, cap their balance sheet. And the Bank of Japan, the few dissenters they have, have actually discussed the merits between rate changes and balance sheet adjustment. This balance sheet is a very important concept that hasn't been given a lot of uh, focus. Why? Because it's very difficult. There's going to be a lot of debate over it. Uh, holding off until you have a perfect plan is probably not the most advisable approach, otherwise you probably wouldn't move. Uh, but he, de he definitely has a point. All right. So Janet Yellen on Thursday is going to be the top uh, listing of these Fed speakers, but uh, the, the takeaway is there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion about uh, monetary policy as a possible catalyst and now anchor against the U.S. dollar. Now, 
if that is the case, I'm going to be watching this pretty closely because there are a number of anti-dollar trades that can uh, line up very nicely to what the technicals say here on the dollar index, a head and shoulders pattern. Head and shoulders patterns are generally reversal patterns. The Euro USD, for example, has a very large inverse head and shoulders pattern with a neckline approximately 108 to 108.25. All right, that's a or 108, uh, yeah, 25. Uh, that's a very clear and decisive uh, uh, level that we can work with, a good pattern. Uh, of course, it's not just going to be U.S. There's going to be Euro area considerations. There is a Eurozone EU finance ministers meeting on Monday. And through the end of this next week, we're going to have the European Union leaders meeting. Uh, so these are important pieces of event risk. And yes, they can stir the existential concerns that uh, don't seem to to plague the euro too much as of right now, but are certainly going to come around uh, to bite it later later on. If that stays in the backdrop, however, and the dollar continues to drop, this is a pretty good technical bearing, and the dollar is more than capable of uh, swinging this currency pair to a significant move. Uh, I'm also quite uh, interested in the potential for the Aussie USD. All right, this would be a little bit more provocative versus the Euro USD. Even if we broke above 108, we're still within a broader range. With the Aussie USD breaking the resistance that we see here, and you can put it about uh, 77.25, 77.50, breaking that is a breakout with that would probably draw or demand some degree of conviction. This is not one of those simple breakouts of necessity which can move uh, modestly and is certainly more easily if it's in a range. This requires some conviction and that might be a little bit more difficult to, uh, to supply. In contrast, the pound dollar, if the dollar continues to drop, will just trade within its range. Yes, Brexit will continue to be a concern as we go into uh, the next week. Uh, we have Theresa May, uh, Prime Minister of the UK, getting the go-ahead uh, for uh, taking Article 50 and invoking it. But we also have considerations like the Scottish First Minister, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, who, see, who is looking to seek a referendum, a second referendum, for uh, withdrawing from the UK. That is a problem that she can probably bat and batter back, uh, Prime Minister May, that is. Uh, but it is uh, going to show the dissension in the negotiation approach that the UK is going to take against the EU, and this is going to be very contentious. Uh, we'll see how much this actually motivates or moves the uh, British pound. I don't think that the CPI figures will really uh, play a big role unless, unless inflation pressures start to pick up fast. The uh, dissenter that we have this past week in the Bank of England rate decision, which was a majority uh, call to hold prices, or hold uh, benchmark rate. Uh, we did have Kristen Forbes who, uh, Forbes, who called for a rate hike, and this is going to start the discussion in the speculative rank that the Bank of England may not be very far from actually uh, going for a normalization move, not just capping its quantitative easing, which we already know is going to happen, uh, but also talking about rate hikes and potentially backing out of that quantitative program, which will be longer. I think it's probably going to be rate hikes first. Uh, but this is going to start that very early discussion about a policy change. And we saw what that did to the dollar back in 2013, 2014. Uh, this can have the same kind of influence on these currencies that are starting to get into that pre-normalization phase. The dollar yen is also a attractive uh, anti-dollar position, but the range has been traversed. Uh, if you are looking to just squeeze out the very last of this juice, there's not much there. Uh, it was a good short-term opportunity to take advantage of the dollar's overbearance and expectations uh, that had been built in in the hawkish sense, um, but the next stage is going to be a break of 112. That is probably not going to be as easy to accomplish just from a dollar's perspective. That's probably going to have to come from a risk view, which we'll discuss next. But before we get to that, uh, it's also uh, an opportunity just from a range perspective if the dollar continues to drop back. Kiwi dollar has some pretty generous range to work with, as does dollar CAD. All right. But back to the dollar yen. Risk trends are certainly very buoyant, uh, almost ebullient at this point. Uh, the complacency is just remarkable, and we're holding very high to these uh, extremes. Take a look at emerging markets. This is an emerging market ETF. This is a, one of the riskier assets in the market. 
right? The performance of riskier assets. When we are really into complacency, when the markets are really stretched in their exposure, they're going to use more leverage, they're going to ha be more reckless abandon about exposure, uh, so they'll go more along, let's say, stocks um, and dedicate more of their funds to that. The diversification will be reduced and people will start favoring higher return, higher risk assets. Emerging markets and high yield fixed income are two of those. Well, look at that emerging market ETF surge that we had after the FOMC rate decision, which, considering this is a higher cost to emerging market economies and, and corporations, that really doesn't look like a very wise uh, rally. Nevertheless, it happened because people were looking to get exposure to risk on. I think that if risk aversion starts to level off and even pull back, Remember, it's very difficult to motivate sentiment trends further unless there's motivation to do so. And monetary policy as a proactive motivator, this was just a response to it wasn't as uh, aggressive as we anticipated. It wasn't an optimism play. It wasn't a renewed growth and, and, uh, and conviction view. It was just... Oh, it wasn't as bad and intense as we expected, so we're going to rally a little bit from our discounted position. If we're not getting drive from upgraded growth forecasts, which are definitely not, in fact, the uh, Atlanta and New York Fed uh, regional uh, central bank re uh, regional uh, presidents have actually updated their forecast for GDP for the first and second quarters, the second quarter for the uh, New York version, uh, both of those had pulled back. And then we also have the strong uh, hope run that had followed the election in which uh, it was vowed by uh, then candidate and now President Trump to reform taxes, to, uh, and, uh, to put in place a infrastructure spending or stimulus program. We still haven't seen the fruits of those uh, efforts. We haven't seen details, we haven't seen a time frame, we certainly haven't seen the growth that would come from them. So it's going to be a struggle to keep this just simply rising, not just the S&P 500, but the more risky of the oriented assets. So something like the dollar yen certainly does have an opportunity if this pulls back, breaking 112, that would be a uh, certainly a motivational uh, consideration. It'd be somewhat cautious though, because when volatility picks up, and this is the volatility of the FX market, when the volatility picks up, the dollar usually is favored. But it has to be something of an intense uh, rise in volatility uh, or deeper risk aversion before the dollar really is prized for its safe, ha safe haven status uh, because it has to get down to the situation where we just care about liquidity. We're not too concerned about the Fed losing all its impetus for further rate hikes. We're not going for the yield, we're going for the safety at that point. All right, so that is something to keep in mind. But in the event of risk aversion, dollar yen first and foremost would probably drop, uh, as would most of the yen crosses. So uh, depending on the timing, pound yen would be a good opportunity from that perspective, but it's probably not going to be ideal like that. Uh, Aussie yen would very much be an opportunity because of its carry influence, the buoyancy of the Australian dollar, and the pullback and risk and carry would pull this probably below 86 uh, and offer a strong run. However, um, I do think that there are some more interesting risk plays uh, that don't require uh, the full-scale reversal. All right, so it's not like I need a full breakdown of the S&P 500 and thereby a full breakdown of the dollar yen. Uh, if it's just a modest drift back in risk trends, take into consideration some of the most overpriced of the assets, the overrun assets like emerging market ETF. This has run very far. Uh, if that's the case, emerging markets start to pull back capital, uh, diversifies back into more liquid markets with high yields like the U.S. Uh, and in turn, we're going to start to see uh, perhaps overrun emerging market currencies are going to pull back and the dollar is going to uh, solidify. Now, that might not be the best course uh, of trade for the dollar CNH, for example, uh, but it can motivate uh, those that are 
have been a little bit more productive in their recent moves. And one of the most noteworthy in my book is the USD MXN, the Mexican peso. Uh, this has a very clear support level, not far below it, about 19. We're coming back very aggressively towards it. Uh, and if you look at the COT figures, we actually have had a remarkable adjustment and exposure for this. Uh, this is perhaps a better opportunity. Remember, I'm always looking for the market conditions that are easier to achieve given uh, appetites, market conditions. In this, a hold of support and a bounce fits technicals, it fits uh, fundamentals. We're not really going for full-scale risk on that would uh, promote a, a very at-risk country and currency like the Mexican peso uh, and furthermore not uh, demand uh, high-scale risk on. Uh, and Generally, it just is an easier path of least resistance kind of move back into a range. That's actually a good collaboration of uh, different analysis techniques uh, supporting the dollar peso. So we're going to be watching this pretty closely. Now, there are other uh, overdrawn risk assets that can present an opportunity along similar lines, uh, but these are uh, some of the more uh, prominent. In terms of top event risk, as I said, the Yellen discussion, maybe the UK CPI figures, uh, the EU finance ministers meeting, as well as the EU summit leader uh, or EU leaders summit on the uh, following weekend, uh, are all noteworthy. Uh, the most intense and concentrated event risk is going to be this RBNZ rate decision. Given how volatile the Kiwi has been this past week, uh, expect this one to be uh, ready to go for a response to this event, especially if the RBNZ finally uh, starts to talk about normaliz normalizing its monetary policy. And if you think that's unlikely, I should remind you that the RBNZ actually has, in the past couple of years, hiked rates. And in fact, at one point, it looked like it was going to hike 225 basis points in the span of four quarters or two years. They backed off of that, obviously, uh, but they were the original return to rate hikes, not the Fed. They're very aggressive. They move much more readily on monetary policy. Their communication is not a holdup for them. Uh, and that is something that absolutely must be kept in consideration. Uh, when we look at the uh, monetary policy itself, Interest rate expectations, according to overnight swaps for the New Zealand dollar, have been pricing in a rate hike uh, for a couple of months, 25 base point rate hike in the span of a year. If we finally see this and solidify this as a very high probability beyond just swaps, then it can definitely help out the Kiwi dollar. So me watching the Kiwi USD. I'm going to be watching the pound Kiwi. All right, this one attempted for a break because the pound was very active through Thursday on the response to that BOE descent. Uh, and the Euro Kiwi. I like the pound Kiwi more if it uh, fails in that break. I like the Euro Kiwi more if it actually achieves that break and goes further higher, although I'd prefer a cheaper entry price. Many more Kiwi-based crosses that you can consider, but those are the two, top two on my, on my list. Now, a couple more words uh, of some remarkable developments that we've seen, not just on the, f the, the face of price action, uh, but more on the depths of positioning. Oil, which had a very impressive uh, past two weeks. The big break that we had below 52, we didn't really extend that too much further this past week. But with this big move and holding to that range, it is no worth noting how speculative positioning in futures markets respond to this. Uh, looking at, uh, there we go, net spec futures positions uh, for oil, big drop back from a record net long. They were trying to pressure this above that uh, 55, 56 uh, upper threshold up here. And bulls were very confident, yet when it pulled back, it took a lot of exposure off. And there is still a lot of exposure here. In fact, when you look at it over time, that was the third largest drop in net long or net exposure uh, overall on record. All right, so that was a big move, but there is still fuel for that fire. 
So we'll see that this more likely is going to lever, lever, level out, uh, but uh, it's exposure and how people are changing their exposures and positions, which dictates where price is going to go. And if the bulls that have tried to push this forward uh, in the face of or in the confidence of the OPEC vows to produce uh, or cut production, then there's a lot more uh, retracement that can come about due to this. I'd also point out gold. All right, this is the uh, non-standard anti-currency currency, uh, and it's been more active. It's also somewhat mixed in its role. Is it really an anti-dollar? Is it an anti-FX in general? Uh, is it a safe haven? Is it an inflation hedge? Inflation is rising, as we can quite clearly see in the Fed's uh, confidence in rate hikes. What does this play? Well, this the role this asset plays changes with time and, and need, but it is not clear on exactly what uh, the traders behind it are going to want to participate in. When it decides, it's going to give us a very uh, important update on how uh, the markets are positioning. Is it going to be a response to risk trends given volatility is extremely low? Uh, I think that this actually might, uh, might bid for traders' attention not just where the dollar is going and do the opposite of that. And the last thing I'm going to look at is the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, also a anti-currency uh, currency. This is a circumvention of capital controls and fiat influence, uh, but once again, it's in another pullback. That's uh, an aggressive two days, Thursday, Friday slide, and this is most likely due to uh, continuous uh, concerns about regulation coming in and alleviating a lot of the immediate use for this for this uh, digital currency. Now, blockchain technology, which fuels Bitcoin, is probably going to be a permanent fixture of finance into the future. Uh, it is better security, uh, but in the long run, uh, that's not what people are trading right now. People are trading right now on this being something of a speculative asset, and the greatest uh, tangible use for this is to circumvent capital controls, essentially a black market for currency and moving funds. Uh, if that is cracked down on, it'll take time before B Bitcoin uh, really gets legitimate appeal, and it once again rises with a kind of value as an investment that people have treated it, uh, treated it as over the past months. All right. So not as much on the docket next week, but don't let that uh, draw you deeper into that complacency that seems to be hypnotizing the markets. Uh, risk aversion, once it kicks in, uh, can kick in for little to no reason. Uh, and given the structure that we're dealing with here, it can be quite devastating and volatile. All right, just be prepared. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown on these markets next week. Until then, I wish you good luck trading, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend.